welcome everybody uh, to tonight's uh, virtual program meeting. Uh, just to remind you, and I, I, I assume that nobody is down at the American Legion waiting for, uh, for us to show up. Uh, what we decided to do for uh, our January and February meetings is to hold them on Zoom because we could, and then we can not worry about the snow, and also we can get some really cool speakers that we can remote in, like uh, tonight's speaker. Uh, and uh, once we get into March, uh, we'll be back at the American Legion and Zoom. Uh, and for those of you that are on uh, Zoom, which is everybody, is um, thanks for the uh, great behavior. Everybody's muted. Um, my recommendation to you is to select the side-by-side -side or speaker view. Um, that way, I'm making some control changes uh, as we go through the meeting, and it will look better uh, but it is certainly possible to keep it on the grid view or gallery view, uh, but it might be kind of confusing. So, um, and and please, uh, you know, uh, ask questions as as they come up. Um, it, I think, well, we can ask Joe later, but uh, I I appreciate the questions. Um, it helps me as a speaker and it helps to make it so that Zoom isn't so artificial. Um, oh, fishing. Uh, so this is uh, yesterday um, and uh, that is a 27 inch brown trout. And the rod is uh, a rod that Joe designed, uh, Joe Goodspeed, our speaker. Uh, that is a diamondback four weight, 10 foot, 10 rod that landed that fish. And I was fishing with Matthew Rabis. And for those of you who uh, that don't know, Matthew is a member of our club. And uh, the fish gods always see that Matthew catches the biggest fish. So this is Matthew's fish. Uh, that that equaled his personal best. That was yesterday. Okay, let me offer a few uh, club announcements. Um, we've got a lot of exciting uh, speakers queuing up. Um, not only tonight's speaker, but uh, in February, uh, Carl Wexelman will rejoin to present on uh, warm water fly fishing in the Erie, Pennsylvania area. Uh, this is Carl with uh, a decent pike, uh, and uh, you will find Carl is a really exciting speaker, and uh, he has a lot to share about uh, fishing in the warm water in Lake Erie, uh, not only for smallmouth, but pike and bowfin and a lot of interesting species. Uh, and then in March, um, that will be back hybrid again. Uh, we'll be back to the Legion and Julie Zer is going to be uh, speaking on Pine Creek. Uh, so make sure to mark your calendars for that. Um, so all the club members should have received a, an announcement by email about these events. Um, it does not come through MailChimp uh, it comes through individual emails, uh, so you should have received one from me and uh, Matt Collins and such. Uh, so make sure to, if if you, I, I've heard that some people didn't notice these because they didn't come through MailChimp. Uh, but the uh, beginner fly tying class is going to start uh, here in a couple of weeks. Uh, it it is uh, it the the students are registered. Uh, Bill has the fly tying materials and will be sending those out eminently. Um, we will be going to Edison to the fly fishing show. Uh, this has been a club tradition now for oh, 15, 20 years. Um, and uh, we hadn't been going because of the pandemic. We have a group of 10 
going so far. Uh, we're going to be joining the uh, folks from Lake Erie chapter and Keystone Fly Fishers. Uh, and so we'll we'll have a group of 20 uh, at the hotel. Uh, so it ought to be a lot of fun. Um, so if you're a club member, you should look for your email uh, uh, about the uh, announcement on the Edison trip. Uh, lastly, as uh, we'll be doing a really cool uh, master class fly tying class in March, Eric Master Birdie uh, is going to lead us through large streamer format uh, tying methods. It's going to be at Carrie's Brew House in Corning. Um, if you're not a member and you want to attend, uh, it's not too late to join and uh, and become a member and then come to the event. Um, if we don't fill the event, there's 15 seats um, that we were going to we are going to open it up in mid February uh, to non-members. And I'm expecting that, that this will be really popular and, and fill. All right. Uh, last uh, announcement is we have uh, established a date for our annual fly fishing school. It's going to be in April 22nd. Uh, as last year, uh, we're going to have it at Wirtz Pond, which is really, really cool because it allows us uh, to have the students fish. Um, as previous years, uh, there is um, casting instruction by our certified casting instructor. Uh, there's classroom, uh, but we also will be spending a couple hours on the Wirtz Pond. Uh, and uh, last year, almost everybody caught fish, uh, but everybody had a great time and really, really appreciated um, the, the class on the water. So uh, right now, one of the most important things you could do to help the club is to talk to your, your buddy, to your family member, your wife, uh, maybe your kids, grandkids, and uh, invite them to become a student. Um, we have learned through the years that the most effective publicity comes from our members. And it comes by a personal invitation by talking to them, either call them up or send them the information. You will find all the information was sent to, through MailChimp through to everybody. Um, and uh, we'll be publicizing that further, expect further emails. Uh, you will also find it on our Facebook page, um, this flyer and further information on our school. Um, okay, and uh, let me just remind you, because we do uh, have a number of folks that join us online and that they're not necessarily a member. Uh, and uh, I just want to remind you that Everything that we do is funded by your help, uh, by your donations, by your participation in our fundraising, everything that we do. Uh, we don't get, our club does not get any money of, uh, of your membership to FFI. All the money that we raise is money that we raise. All the money we have is money we raise. So, um, we would like to invite uh, folks who are, especially folks that are joining us online. Uh, you've been very generous in the past and and helping us uh, continue this work, but we're trying something new here. And uh, <clears throat> so this QR code, if you scan it with your phone, will lead you to our PayPal uh, donation site. You can donate online and it's very easy to do and uh, it really helps the club out a lot. All right, I'm going to turn things over to, to, uh, to TC to introduce our speaker. Good evening, folks. Uh, thank you all for being here. It's great to see that we have such a, a good turnout starting off um, the new year. So thanks for Thanks for joining tonight. Um, 
you know, Joe and I were talking before um, before this meeting got underway. I'm pretty sure that this is the first. So the first event that I attended, the first uh, monthly presentation meeting that I ever attended of FFI was must have been 2019 or very early 2020 at Big Flats Community Center. And Joe was the speaker that night talking about uh, tight line nymphing techniques in Finger Lakes Tribs. And uh, it was a great talk. So it's really, really awesome to have him back here again tonight. Um, I know he's going to bring a lot of information our way about foul, false albacore fishing. So um, uh, Joe's talked to our club. Uh, this will be his third time tonight. Um, but for so for many of us, he needs no introduction. But for those that are joining us for the first time, uh, Joe Goodspeed has a background as a professional in the fly fishing industry, including product development at Cortland Line Company, rod designer at Thomas and Thomas Fly Rods, and now as a rod designer for Diamondback Fly Rods. Uh, although he has designed a wide range of products, his specialty European nymph rod blanks are considered some of the leading products in that product segment across the world. Joe also has fly patterns ranging from crayfish flies to musky flies that are sold commercially through Fulfill, uh, Fulling Mill and Orvis. He currently lives in... Uh, Brattleboro, Vermont. And just to, you know, uh, you know, Joe's a absolute innovator in in the sport. Um, you know, uh, Kirk's talk in December really highlighted a lot of the really innovative techniques that he's brought to uh, European nymphing. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that he's gonna bring some uh, similarly unique perspectives to false albacore fishing as well. So um, without any further ado, I'll kick it to you, Joe. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, TC. I uh, am <clears throat> completely distracted by that musky photo since musky season is after uh, false albacore season and I, I transition from one to the other. But uh, I am excited to talk to you guys about, uh, about false albacore. And I have spoken with this group, and I'm sure there's some people that might be in the group that I've spoken to before about either big trout or steelhead or predator fishing. But uh, for the past about six years, I became really fascinated with the false albacore. And uh, I've never lived any closer than about two hours away from the uh, from the ocean. So I, you know, Kirk was just talking about making two hour day trips, and boy, I've made a lot of two hour day trips for these things. But the false albacore is something that I found after spending some time fishing for them that it was a very misunderstood fish, and for me, for everything that I that I do fish for, really understanding the fish is an important aspect of how to catch the fish, how to, how to target the fish. And what I have come to realize about the false albacore is there is a correlation between what the anglers experience success with when they manage to catch these fish that drives a uh, misunderstanding of what of what the fish is doing, and the false albacore is a fish that swims around uh, in big packs under the surface. If the if the ceiling here was the surface, and when they when they're a blitzing fish, and when they come into view, they move super fast, and they can they can feed at forty miles an hour, and people see these the fish moving lightning fast across the surface and there is a common perception that you just pull the flies through the water as fast as you can when you cast wherever you can see fish breaking the surface and and rip the flies away from those fish or there's 
some people let flies uh, sink down and have people catch them all different ways. And what, uh, what I began to realize about the fish is that what uh, a, good, a good thing to do with this fish is there's drone footage where you can see all of these fish in clear ocean water feeding and you can see where they break the surface and where the fish really are. And the fish don't move as fast as they feed on the surface all the time. They oftentimes are moving at a very calculated slow speed. And then when one of them decides to feed, they follow each other and they do a, a feeding sequence where as they come into view, they're moving really, really fast and then they'll settle down. And if you can see into the water, you'll see them feed and then slow down and then, you know, sometimes pick up and feed again if they're, if they're not in a big pack. And understanding that the fish aren't always moving super fast and they're only moving really fast when they're working together feeding on something or when they've picked out a food item is a, is a really important thing to understand about the false album. And the, uh, the way the fish feed has to do with being down in the water and being able to silhouette food items well above them, often in the sunlight. The majority of time that the false albacore feed, you have clear water that they use to feed on bait that is above them that they work from below, whether it's moving bait into a bait ball and blitzing on them, or it's just choosing random food items. And that's a really important thing to understand as far as having a perspective of how to fish for that fish is that they choose food items from, think of it as 15 or 20 feet away below and uh, you know at an angle of where they can see the food items. And there's a lot of different food items. There's really a handful of things that they commonly feed on when they migrate through the uh, through the Northeast. And I I know there's a lot of basic, you know, I, I'm skipping over a lot of uh, stuff here without uh, having, uh, I know there's a lot of preconceived ideas that are true about the false albacore. You know, they, they, they blitz on bait. You can see these explosive feeding elements. They'll come through uh, Cape Cod and Long Island Sound and then the Montauk area and then they'll move south down to uh, North Carolina, uh, the Outer Banks, Harker's Island. There's a lot of places along the northeast coast where these these fish will commonly be and the food items that they're feeding on are often going to be either bay anchovies, silver side minnows, peanut bunker which are kind of shad shaped, or squid. Those are really the, some of the primary in most situations baits that the uh, that those false albacore will be will be feeding on when they are anywhere along the northeast coast. And what the fish are feeding on really drives the behavior of of how they're of what it looks like they're doing and how fishermen perceive what they're doing. With bay anchovies, which are often tiny. Uh, it's the easiest time to catch the false albacore. They'll push the bay anchovies into balls and they'll form a blitzing feed where they go and clean up the stragglers. And it's a situation where the guys that are just casting and pulling the fly out fast will oftentimes catch the fish. With a silver side, it's a bigger food item. They're hunting a little bit more for them than when they're blitzing on the bay anchovies the easiest time to catch the, uh, the the false albacore because they'll they'll work on the surface, but they'll also be hunting and looking for bigger food items. Uh, when there's peanut bunker, it's the, it's the hardest time to catch them because they're big food items and they don't eat all that many of them compared to a bay anchovy and they work the bait differently where they'll ball them up and they'll take single bait off the outside and not be cleaning up uh, cleaning up as many stragglers. So that's the hardest time to target the fish. But the most important thing to understand about what those fish see when they look at the bait is that nearly every 
type of food item that they eat looks pretty similar from 20 feet away underneath backlit by light in clear water. And I, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, before I get into flies, I wanna talk about the, the false impressions of how people perceive this fish. I, I put down a little bit of a, a basis for the, uh, that fish now. People only get positive feedback when they catch fish and especially on a really difficult fish like a muskie or like a false albacore, depending on the situations of when someone's fishing for them, they will, uh, the false albacore, when they blitz into a pod, if you can get to that fishing situation and when they're really feeding heavily, it's easy to get them to eat if you can get your fly into the area where there is a blitz happening. And for many people, the perception of this fish is, unless you find that blitz happening, you're not catching the fish. And the fish are much more catchable than that. You don't need to be into the blitz to be catching them, but the fly is really important for this you know, fish that has uh, huge eyes, is monochromatic, which means it can't really see all shades of color, it only seeds sees certain shades. And for a uh, fish like that, for people to get this perception that they can use all kinds of ridiculous flies for the fish, there are many people who will show you a box of absurdly bad flies for fishing for this species of fish that have all caught fish. And for uh, an angler with the perception that when the fish are blitzing, if you can get to that and you can fish, they'll often tell you, oh, I could, you know, the, the big fly, the, you know, ridiculous, you know, fly, the pink over chartreuse fly was catching the fish. And in the right situations, that's true. Muskie is the same way. When muskies are in a tiny feeding window, the most ridiculous flies might catch one. And people get the perception that ridiculous flies are a good thing to use. You just, you know, don't get many bites. And that's that's not the case with muskies and with albies. It's not the case that a ridiculous attractor fly is a good thing to use. Even though they will work in a, in a blitzing situation, having flies that match the light silhouette profile <clears throat> that the fish that can't see color use to identify their food items from a long ways away before they make that rapid 40 mile an hour move to come and get them. That's the most important thing to understand about the fish. And when someone shows you a box of ridiculous flies for this fish, it's probably the case that they all will work under the easiest conditions. And in the conditions where only a really good fly and presentation might work. Those are situations where a lot of the people that target these fish are never going to catch anything. And so they, uh, but because they do get consistent success in these small windows of visual blitzes, you, they can become, you know, very focused to a small window of what reality is for how the, uh, how the fish behave. So what those fish see, if you've, uh, there's been some pictures done of what a, what a minnow looks like back, backlit. And the, especially the bay anchovies and silver sides, which make up the algae food almost the majority of the time, depending on the, the year, your class of bait and, and where you are. If you look at those backlit, the only thing that's opaque on those is the air sac from underneath the, from the head to the anal vent of the minnow, there is an opaque solid air sac that is uh, not translucent, but the rest of the bait fish is. The, they can have a silver, uh, both banchovies and silver sides have a silver stripe on the side, but from underneath, the light passes right through them. And Kirk, could you get into the photos and just pop through the first couple of, 
of fishing situations and then get into uh, the flies? Give me a second here, buddy. <clears throat> that work yep that's the that's the west wall in rhode island and for for where i am the uh the rhode island coast is some of the closest water for me to get to the ocean it's a lot closer than cape cod so i fish rhode island and connecticut uh when, when the fish are there the false albacore move from they start around the islands of Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket, and then they move to the central part of Cape Cod, and then they move into Long Island Sound. So there's usually fish in Cape Cod for a little while before there's fish in Rhode Island, but uh, the Rhode, Rhode Island, Long Island Sound consistently gets the, uh, the false albacore, and the fish stay there later than they will oftentimes be uh, fishing well out in Cape Cod as they move, uh, they kind of move west and then they move south. So kick another photo forward. That's, these are very different shore locations. Uh, one in, one there in Rhode Island here, one here in, uh, in Connecticut of uh, the, the way the fish behave from spot to spot really depends on the shape and the depth of the spot. And, uh, those are two very different uh, spots where one's a break wall and one is just a, uh, a deep shoreline abutment. Next photo. There's one in the water. Next photo. Okay, so here I'm gonna I'm gonna look at uh, these. I'm gonna look at some flies, a certain fly from a couple different angles and. I think there's a couple different attributes that define a good fly for false albacore, and they are they're they're really not just the one-dimensional visual uh, visual thing. That uh, when you see a epoxy fly, someone can make an epoxy fly that in one dimension looks exactly like a minnow. However, the way the light shines through them and the way they move through the water and the way they move through the water when you pull them online all leave something to be desired. And so there's certain attributes of a couple different albi flies that they look very different from each other. And the reason that they're successful all has to do with the same core reasons of why these things choose a food item. One of them, which looks nothing like the fly that I have here in my hand, is called the albihor. And there's a certain fly that has a feather tail and an estaz body. And it's a big, you know, fluffy, sparkly fly that can be in a couple different colors. And it's a fly that has a solid, opaque profile from underneath. And it's a fly that has enough material that has water resistance that it allows it to slow down in the water in between strips, which is something that an epoxy fly that is very heavy does not do. An epoxy fly that's very heavy is heavy enough that when you pull it, it has momentum and it'll keep carrying forward in between your poles. It's very hard to get an epoxy fly to pause and Having a fly that will pause and have an opaque uh, profile from underneath are two critical elements that make up what causes a fish from 20 feet below that is used to looking for food items that have an opaque section and a translucent section behind them and some flash on the side. The, the albihor is also a fly that has a uh, lateral flash and any of the minnows that these fish feed on, if one is in distress, it will roll on its side and in the bright sunlight, it will cause a silver flash. Uh, Kurt, could you kick forward another photo? So 
this is a photo of the same same fly from the previous uh, from the previous slide, but from underneath. And you'll see that this fly has also like the uh, Dave Scope albivore, it uses estaz as a body. And estaz, when it's wrapped tight like this, is sort of like deer hair, where it creates a water resistance that slows something down so that it doesn't carry forward through the water too fast, which is which is a horrible thing to happen when you're trying to get a fly to uh, pause in the water. So uh, kick, kick forward one more photo here. OK, so here is this is a photo I took this fall from North Carolina. And here you have a, a, a bay anchovy that was coughed up by an albacore in the, in the middle. And then you have two flies, top and bottom, one of them that has a silver stripe attached to it, and the one on the bottom that doesn't. And this is, both of these are effective flies. The one on the top, that silver stripe on the side is a more effective fly. And I'm not gonna talk, talk too much longer about the fly, but this is, this is certain, this is, a certain fly I, I came up with that has a uh, underbody of estaz and a back of cashmere goat hair, which is a translucent hair that has a great wiggle and movement in the water. And this fly has epoxy on the back, which holds the fly in place. And it has epoxy all the way through the material at the bend of the hook which makes the, this, this fly be nearly indestructible, very similar to a, a fly where the whole thing is epoxy. However, the belly of the fly is not the weight of epoxy. It's a spun, fluffy, trimmed uh, estaz. And that means that there is weight on the back of the hook and there's weight on the bend of the hook, but the central part of the fly has a fluffy material that has a much lower density. And what this does with this fly in the water that's completely different than nearly anything you might compare it to is it has a balance of how much weight is on the back and how much weight is on the bend of the hook. So it's nearly unbalanced. Like it nearly wants to, when you pull it, roll and not stabilize. Whereas a fly that has epoxy through the entire body and the bend of the hook is very cleanly keeled and isn't going to roll very much. It's going to kind of keep a very uh, straight position because the weight is not unbalanced within the axis of the where your line is tied. For this fly on top that has a silver stripe on it, what that causes is when you twitch that fly through the water, it rolls on its side and it flashes silver which uh and also it slows down and pauses because the body has enough estaz that the the water resistance with the estaz allows the fly to pause and so if you look at anything that consistently catches this species of fish it will have these attributes of where it's opaque from the bottom and has oftentimes a pearl look that's similar to what the air sac of a minnow looks like when you back uh, backlight it with the uh, sun. And these fish don't feed in, until the sun comes out. You know that they need the sun to feed because in the clear water you can go out at dawn and wait until the sun comes out and then they'll start to push the bait to the surface because that sun and being in clear water, they don't feed effectively in dirty water. They need the clear water and the light above them to effectively push the bait to the surface. And all of that is part of how they see the food items. But if you have something like this that looks, and so this fly also has translucency, and with this species of fish that have eyes that don't see color, but see really well, you know, their eyes are like the size of a quarter, and things that are very translucent cause them to bite them. There are some lures, like uh, there's an albi snack lure 
that uh, spin fishermen use. That's a great big translucent or pearl white colored soft plastic that has good movement in the water. And that big food item that's either translucent or the pearl color of a air sac with good movement is a, is a great way to catch you know, these fish. And so when you can combine all of these elements of translucency, movement, things that can pause and things that roll on their side and flash, those are all you know, reasons why this fly that I'm showing you here is a, a super effective fly. And uh, for me this fall, I landed 35 of these things from shore. And uh, although I do put in plenty of time, the way that I am going about fishing for them now is very effective and oftentimes catches them when there's not a good feeding opportunity in front of you. And the, they'll seemingly come out of nowhere when your fly is really good. And so, you know, a lot of what goes into catching these things is having something on the end of your line that is just the right thing even though they might bite all kinds of things in the, in the easy situations, if you wanna catch them in diverse situations, having some sort of a food item that they can easily find and is looking like what they use to identify food items under all kinds of situations, you can allow you to use really one you know, fly in a lot of situations and always have something that those fish will identify as a food item. Uh, we'll go one one more uh, slide over. That's uh, a similar fly tie there. And you can just see the translucency of the cashmere goat. <clears throat> but okay, so I, I hit on the fly there, the presenting that fly, how that fly is shown to the fish is- Hey, hey the, Joe. Yep. Let me um, just ask a question about so the cashmere goat in this pattern is the like the tannish beige color? Yes. Okay. And then uh, the epoxy goes um, along the back of it uh, on the top of the hook shank. And then uh, you have some at the bend. Is, is, did I follow that right? The, the one in this picture is actually has some epoxy lightly through the estaz below the body but okay. the the in the in the previous photo the uh i i i think that th this was i just pulled together some photos quickly and this was a photo where you could see the translucency of the cashmere goat i don't think this is the best tie of this fly as far as using it as an example if you go back go back two or three go back one more yeah look at look at this one so this is a little bit bigger uh, fly, and I having having a, a pretty meaty offering is something that's important for this fish. If you're not imitating a certain food item where you can see them, and you know a, a fly like this is about three inches long. That's I think it's a one aught size uh, fly, but there you can see a little bit better. The epoxy is on the back, and it's through the bend uh, yeah. behind the hook. And it looks like there's some um, white fibers coming out uh, from the tail area. Yes, there is a there's a there's a translucent uh, Steve Farrar UV white flash blend coming out the back of this that's that's trimmed down to shape uh, below that cashmere goat and before the pearl estaz. I I just love hearing you talking about fly design. It's 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 so innovative. I'm hoping that Eric gives me some credit for the uh, for the predator flies. That not that Eric is not an excellent fly tire, but uh, I would like to like to think I've had some influence on some of the predator stuff that uh, he might talk about. I think he does. Oh, oh. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to I'm going to move on to. I'm trying to, I've got lots of things to say about these fish and I'm trying to get it into a, a presentation length uh, thing here. Presenting the flies to these fish is the other really important aspect. So now, you know, let's say you're using a, a fly like, like I have uh, here. 
being able to turn your fly over fully straight and have the fly start moving right after it hits the water is absolutely paramount. And for, for me, I, I'm with, with designing the, the rods and lines and things, I'm a good caster, you know, and when I started doing this, I definitely, you know, would go to shoreline places and just rip hero casts like as far as I possibly could. And, you know, with these like eight or nine weight rod and intermediate line, you can cast a long way. However, no matter how good of a caster you are, you can't cast a really long way under pressure of the fish flying through in front of you consistently without having things go wrong. No matter how good you are, you know, if you've got maximum line out, you're not going to clear that line under duress every time. And you're probably going to get tangled nearly every time when you have a uh, tuna, you know, fish come into view or come past you, uh, really high stress situation. And doing this for a few years, I started to realize that the best anglers, the most successful anglers, we're not casting nearly towards the maximum range of how far they might be able to cast. You, I would see guys who would not have that much line out who would oftentimes be hooked up on fish. And once I, but the reason is they have control of their line at close range and long range. And a lot of the opportunities for uh, this fish if you're fishing a long structure, happen right at your feet because the, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm gesticulating too much here. The, uh, especially if the wind is blowing towards you, it will pin bait on the feature that you're standing on and the fish will often look to feed right tight against what you're standing on. And there's a, a, a key move for fishing for, from shore for false albacore of having just the right amount of line out where in no more than two, maybe three false casts at most of having your line in the air, you can put your line down and cast it so it comes tight to the end where you've got such control of your line that you can turn it over straight and feel the line, you know, come tight at the end of the cast confidently. And that might only be 40 feet away. It might be less than that if the wind is blowing in your face, but being realistic with yourself of not how far you could maximum cast, how far you can realistically cast under pressure with a couple false casts under control, that's your range. And within that range, you can often, you know, that you might have 40, 50 feet of line out uh, in a stripping basket, but you can still make a shorter cast. Whereas you, if you have 80 feet of line out in a stripping basket, your line's gonna get into a tangle. So uh, finding the balance between how far you can confidently under control cast your line so it turns over straight. And you know, if you're not getting to that point, reeling some line in until you're at that point, what that allows you to do is put the fly down and start moving it immediately. And for whatever the tuna species, be it a 150 pound bluefin tuna or a six pound false albacore, having your fly look alive the moment it hits the water is the name of the game. Because the fish can identify their food items so far away underwater that if your fly lands and you're not able to turn your leader over straight, and I'm going to talk about leaders in a minute because leader is critical. If your leader doesn't turn over straight, the number of strips it takes you to recover the amount of line in between where your fly is and where your fly line comes straight to pulling the fly in is this really crappy, unnatural looking thing that the fly does that the tuna will see before your fly starts doing lively things. And they'll, a lot of the fish that are within range of seeing your fly will already have rejected it before you get it moving. But 
on the contrary, if you can land your fly straight, you'll oftentimes have a false albacore bite it before <clears throat> you know what happens, as opposed to having it land in a pile. And so the casting distance and then the leader are both very important. The leader has to help you turn your fly over confidently. And you need to turn over, you need to have about three feet of good clean tippet and then tied straight to your fly without any crap. But if you have that, you can have the rest of your leader can really be kind of coarse as long as it gets the job done to get that, you know, maybe 15, 17, 20 pound class leader turned over straight. And for me, I never, I don't use loops in a leader for anything else except for this, because it's more important when things are going on and you need to re-rig quickly to be able to loop in a clean three foot piece of whatever tippet you prefer to get a new fly on there, then it is critical to have a certain taper built out that you would need to fix if your line breaks and you know these things will chafe in the rocks, stuff will happen. You know, you need to have something really durable in a taper that works for you up to a loop, and then you loop in three feet of whatever tippet you prefer, and you can pre-make looped three foot pieces of tippet that when, you know, say the fish are blitzing and you're in good fishing, you can just get that, you know, sc scrapped up piece of leader off. So what's behind that needs to be really durable, have a very steep taper profile. I use really hard fluorocarbon materials in 40, 30, 25, and then a loop. And I like that stretch to be about six feet long. So it's like three feet of 40, two feet of 30, a foot of 25, a loop, and then three feet of, I oftentimes use uh, Seaguar and Bizex 17 pound. I think it's a really nice uh, size. I don't like to go below 15. I, if you get into a big fish, they'll break your line on the, uh, on the beats. And there are guys who will tell you to use as light as 12. If you have good flies and good, clean, straight leaders, I don't think it's necessary to go that light <clears throat> personally. You know, some, some people may disagree with, the, with that, but 15 is as light as I'll go. And I'll use 20 most of the time, really. But uh, so having that steep tapered leader turns your fly over, having a line whether it be a floating, intermediate, or sinking line that you can really control well and you can pick up off the water. And it really rules sinking lines out in a lot of situations, although a sinking line is an effective way to get into fish. It's, an, it's a poor way to put a fly down accurately and you catch fish with the sinking lines more because you get the flies in front of fish that are not in view. But if you can see fish feeding, for me, you want to have an intermediate line and you want the intermediate lines cast really well. They turn over well. You can wait and get them to fish deeper or you can fish quickly and keep them on the surface. The intermediate line is, uh, is a great balance of what you can do with it. And you need to have a line and rod balance that matches well enough where you can load the rod at close range and get the rod flexing and unloading and moving the fly line through the rod, and generating some line speed without having too much line out. And that allows you to make sure accurate casts if the fish are running right close to shore or they pop up right in your lap, but also allows you to get the rod flexed and create some line speed so you can let a little bit of line uh, go and be able to shoot line. And so having a rod that loads with your line, having the right balance of line weight where it's heavy enough to load it at close range, but still light enough to carry a longer cast when you need to. For me, a fast action nine weight rod with about a 300 grain intermediate head. I like the Scientific Angler 30 foot uh, sonar 
line in 300 grains on nine weight uh, rods. So here's, uh, <clears throat> here's one of the rigs that I use. It's, uh, you wanna have a reel that's like, uh, that can stop a fish that's gonna run 100 or 200 yards away under heavy pressure. So uh, a lot of guys use uh, Ted Jura 6 Tybor reels. I've got, uh, I've got a number of uh, custom silver Islanders that I like to use. And as long as they're not malfunctioning, they're great. Sometimes the Islander drags slip when it's, uh, when it's rainy, oftentimes is when I'll have a problem with the, uh, the Islanders. But uh, the rods I have been using are a nine foot four inch fast action rod and having a rod that's a little bit longer than nine feet when you're on the rocks and trying to keep your line up off of obstructions and to be able to pick it off the water at distance is those are all helpful, uh, helpful things. So once you have, and I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to wrap this up in the next, it's 722, I'm going to try to keep it in the next five minutes. I've got a lot of other stuff to say, but I'll, I'm going to keep it short here and maybe we can do a little bit of questions before it's over. The uh, putting the fly down and getting it moving is critical. So I showed you that, you know, type of six foot leader, very fast tapered leader, looped, maybe a one inch loop knot looped onto, I just do an overhand loop with, uh, with these heavier uh, monos, the straight section. You want to be able to have that fly slap down on the water, boom. The slap will cause fish to notice it and come eat it sometimes, but you also want to be able to put it down and get it to move immediately. And the way to do that is to practice making a cast where as you make your final cast, you have control of the line, you know, you have enough line out, you're under control of it. As you make your forward cast, it turns over before it comes down to the water. The thing to practice is to make that cast, and as the line is in the air, getting ready to turn over straight to, uh, oftentimes, um, you know, people will do a two-hand presentation for these fish, and I think it's a it's really the best way to hook the fish because of how hard you they take the fly and how much impact you want to drive the uh, hook home with making a cast where as the line is in the air, you tuck the rod under your arm and get a hold of the line up near the first stripping guide as the, as the fly comes down and hits the water. So the fly can slap onto the water and then you make your first movement. <clears throat> Having that control is the difference between catching a bunch of them and not catching them or catching one. Being able to consistently make presentations where your fly turns over straight and then moves within a second or two of when it hits the water. Everything that sees that fly land, and they might be seeing it from, I don't know how far away, 50 feet in clear water, see that as a, as a viable food item. And so when that, those one single fish come out of nowhere and you hook the fish when they're not blitzing, it's because you've shown them something that looks and is behaving viably in the water and if you're not doing that, you'll see sometimes guys just casting lures out into the water will be getting them around you while you are not able to get them to bite. And the difference is often not that the bait or lure is that much better they're using, the presentation. If uh, Even when the fishing is good, that presentation makes all the difference in hooking up, you know, very consistently or getting the fly moving and you know running into them here and there when your presentation is good that's what that's the presentation that uh that gets them to uh to to bite and that's something that i don't know any other species where having besides the tuna we're having that level of control the moment the fly hits the water is as important so it's close to 7 30 i don't know if you guys want to open this up to a couple questions i know that I bounced around really fast on this and you know it wasn't a real organized presentation if there's anything you guys have for questions I'd be happy to uh to field them now we have questions uh I've never 
shy about questions. Questions, Kirk, you know that. Hi, Joe. Um, thanks for speaking to us tonight. Really appreciate it. Um, you know, I, I fish salt a little bit, and either on a beach or a jetty, there's often waves coming right at you. And with a fly line, uh, what I find is they get caught up in the waves and then they get pushed around and and so forth. And um, you know, it can make a can kind of make a mess. How do you manage that? Are you just retrieving it more quickly? Are you getting it up out of the water and recasting before it gets into the wave zone, the breaker zone, or are you not fishing those areas? I am fishing those areas. I, you know, the when the when the when the wind and waves are coming at you, it pushes the bait towards you, and the best fishing close to you is oftentimes when the waves are coming at you within reason you know if that mm -hmm. often will the waves can often blow debris towards you as well so a light wind coming towards you is good a heavy wind coming towards you you know can get when it gets uncomfortable to the point that you can't you know control the fly based on the amount of waves coming in yes you know i agree however i fish in a lot of heavy waves and Finding a place to stand where you're, you want to be closer to the water, because uh, when you have a big arc of line between where you stand and the water, the waves really manipulate that, and it becomes hard to control the fly. And so, if you can have your tip down near water level, you can kind of eliminate what the waves do with breaking up the uh, contact with your fly. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. You, you need an intermediate. You know, if you have a floating line, the waves really make it a mess. Having an intermediate line, the line's a, a little bit heavier, a little bit stiffer. Usually, the, the waves will work over an intermediate line. Where with a floating line, it becomes okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Other other questions. Uh, I've got another one. Go ahead, do it. So, Joe, your there was a picture of your fly boxes. Yeah, and it, it looked like kind of the same fly, and and like one box was entirely the same color, maybe a couple different sizes. The other box had some color variations, but they're all very similar. I mean, is that typically what you go with? I mean, is that all you need basically to be consistently? successful the the more i've done it the less different flies i have used and you know you'll see there's kind of some squid flies down here in the corner i was also like the angler that i described in this presentation where i had flies that caught fish when the fishing was really good that yeah, yeah. you know i using those flies i would be fishing very well and be working hard for the bites in a lot of the situations and i've come to the conclusion that a really good natural fly always outfishes an attractor fly and the attractor flies for this species of fish work well when the fishing is easy and there really are not situations when the fishing is not easy, where, you know, like a pink over white fly, which is a viable pattern. Anything over white is a viable pattern. So they can't really see color and they see what's on the underside of the, uh, of the minnow. And so there's a lot of overlap in the flies that are effective of what they look like from underneath. But also there's ridiculous flies that guys can show you fish they've caught on them because it's a fish that 5% of the fishing opportunities are so easy that you could be fishing with a woolly bugger or, you know, pretty much anything with a hook on it that you could pull out of a blitz for such a fast moving predatory fish that's cleaning up, you know, broken up bait fish and doesn't see color. All, everything that's, you know, a viable item in there is going to be good 
but that doesn't mean it's a good fly, you know? And that's where I was saying that the people can get kind of this very distorted view of what's effective based on the spectrum of fish behavior of when they're, you know, blitzing, right. when they're just in the area and you might be able to catch them if you're fishing well with something nice. Yep, makes sense. Could you could you follow this, uh, Kirk? That was, I do have a lot to say about this. I, I definitely jumped uh, jumped around there and didn't do much of a much of an introduction to what I was going to talk about. <laughs> well, Joe, um, uh, I. I, I think that uh, like anytime you've talked, there's so much uh, new to absorb and so much to pay attention to um, that it's always uh, takes my full attention to to to, uh, to hear what you have to share. Um, if if you would, so there's people in the call tonight that have saltwater fished and caught albator before and uh there's there's some people on the call who have never cast a fly line for saltwater fish and um i'm going to invite you to um um is is what's your kind of recommendations for those people that are kind of intrigued by what you have to say and just want to kind of get out there and try it where would you recommend a beginner start uh in the salt if you the the timing of this is very consistent there's one certain place that has room for everybody when it's good it's the most consistent spot to hook them in the Northeast, the West Wall in Point Judith, Rhode Island. Anytime from the first week of September to the middle of October, on any given day that the weather is stable, you're very likely to be able to walk out onto the West Wall and see, you might not catch one, but you'll, you'll see people catching these things and you'll see these fish showing themselves and the the west wall is a great place to target because it's a break wall and the fish run lateral to it it's 25 30 feet deep along it you can't see the fish but they're just in front of you and so guys getting a fly out in the water it doesn't have to be that far if you're making a viable presentation that's a spot where a lot of times I'll hook fish a rod length away off of the rocks and uh, this last year was really, really good. I had a number of days where I hooked more than 10 from, uh, from shore. And that's very exhilarating uh, fishing to, to be able to get into a whole bunch of, uh, of this species, which just catching one, you know, makes, makes the day. And over the past six years, I went from catching, you know, two in a season to five in a season to 15 in a season to 35 in a season, you know, with a similar amount of time on the water. And so, you know, that whole time I was someone who was a great caster and, you know, had a lot of tricks in my bag and still, you know, it's a challenging thing, but it's a very exciting thing. And the time and place I just mentioned, the, you know, middle of September and the West Wall on Point Judith, you can mark your calendar and go there then and see some stuff that for me, having done all kinds of stuff, you know, I've caught mako sharks, trophy muskies, pretty much anything across the Northeast you can imagine. I think this is the number one sport fishing opportunity in the Northeast to do this from shore. So, you know, for me, for everything else that I do, when this opportunity is available in the fall every year, it's you know there's nothing else that i'm i'm gonna do you know and it used to be steelhead you know i went from you know the fall steelhead to this and you know i'll musky wait until pretty late season for me because i'll i'll do this right up until i got them in november from shore two years ago this last year i got up and got up, got them until about october 25th in the northeast so it's 
it can be mid mid August to you know to November of a season to try to target them, but in the middle of September, middle of October, in the peak of the migration, it's a really good opportunity to to go and do it. So, so Joe, as somebody's handled a, a false albacore before, one of the uh, reasons to fish for these is the incredible pull that this fish is capable of. Can you describe for somebody who's not ever dealt with a false albacore at the end of their line, more about this pull and how exciting it is to have, be hooked up on one of these fish? The, the best way I can describe it is for a little while this fall, the smallest false albacore I've ever seen were along the west wall in Rhode Island. They're about three pounds. And I hooked a three pounder at my feet and didn't clear, you know, my line with 15 pound test. Boom! You know, fish broke my line, you know, is you know, if you if you don't clear your line with uh with false albacore, it doesn't matter if it's a small one and you're using heavy line, they're gonna break your line. The you know uh a six pound false albacore would tail drag a 40 inch striped bass in in my opinion, having caught both of those things. So uh, having, you know, with with the reel, like in my, my smaller Islander with a drag turned all the way down, a medium sized false albacore will take 150 yards of line in, in one run they fight way harder from shore. If you've caught them from boats and you haven't caught them from shore, they fight two and a half times harder from shore than they do from a boat. It's you can't compare, you know, a big one from a boat doesn't fight as hard as a medium one from uh, shore, just the shallower water and they fight laterally instead of vertically is uh super exhilarating. They make runs to the point where I can take my phone out and take a video of the fish running for 10 seconds and put the phone away before the fish stops running. Wow. Uh, to talk more about, so uh, you, you mentioned about using a nine way um, and uh, I, I kind of know the answer, but I'm suspicious that uh, this is a, a question that folks might have. I what, saw a, photo, a, a question down here at the bottom. It's yeah. a scientific angler, clear intermediate 30 foot head sonar. I think it's the sonar 300 grain, the sonar lines that are intermediate and they're sold in grain weight sizes. Those are, I use those a 250 grain on my eight weight and 300 grain on the nine weight, but to load the rod and to have a short to long range, I suggest a nine a nine weight rod with a three hundred grain line. Hey Joe, did you see the other question there? Uh, how do you land the fish? As the fish gets near shore, I will get a hold of the line, and then they they do like a like a tuna they tuna circle. Uh, you're using you know, they fight hard, they tire themselves out from the initial runs. And when you get them to shore, uh, they'll still dig into the water. But if you can get their head to break the surface of the water, you can kind of slide them with 17 to 20 pound test. I'll get, you know, my hand on the line and pull them in. And then you grab the wrist of their tail. You know, the tail is like a T. So it's a very firm thing to hold on to. Uh, but you don't use a net. No. no. I nets are for muskies, Kurt. That's the only fish I net. Okay. Okay. Good. No, I was just repeating a question that somebody asked. Well, okay. hang on a minute. <laughs> I mean, if you're on a wall or a, or a rock jetty, you can't really beach the fish, right? No. Oh, but you. When you've got 20 pound test and you're landing a seven pound fish, you can get a hold of your leader and lift it up to where you can grab the uh, grab the tail. And a lot of times, oh, I especially see. the older anglers will kind of slide the fish 
you know, up, up the rocks once they get them to the leader. I see. Okay. So you're, you're actually the last little bit, you're actually just hoisting them. Basically, I, I go down to the water level and I you know they're usually on the surface of the water when I get them by the tail. Okay. I like to drag them over the rocks, but yeah, yeah. Plenty of, plenty of people do. Okay. Thanks. It depends on where you are. I will say that I caught some fish from a break wall in, in Newport, Rhode Island this year that was well above the water that uh, someone, I, I did have, I did have a couple fish netted from a elevated kind of like pier type area this, uh, this fall. So some, you know, sometimes okay. you got no, you know, no choice. I don't know if I could, I would have been trying to lift those fish up by hand a ways otherwise. Yeah. I'm, I'm imagining like similar to the wall in Oswego or something where people bring these long handled nets and yeah you know but you can't really present a fly too high above the water because of the arc of the line and so oh, okay only, you know if you're going to be hooking them you're usually going to be close enough to the water where you can you know oh, okay the line laterally across the water and then you're also not like way down to the water to land the fish right right okay uh, and joe how are you setting the hook on these fish you just try not to have your line break. The, the fish eat and you come tight to them and then whatever line you have, you, you try to make sure it doesn't wrap around the reel as it clears. The, you never really set the hook. The, when an when a albie eats your fly and starts to go, you catch up to it and then you react. It, uh, there's you don't you never feel a bite and then and then set the hook it just you know tuna yeah. speed is and and they move fast when they eat that's that's the reason right. why anytime an albie feeds it they're already on the move through the food item so when they eat your fly in a moment there are six eight feet beyond it so your line you know They'll, when when you're in larger fish, you know you could you can have fish break twenty pound test. You know just as you don't let go of the line, the impact is brutal. Is the only way I can I can you know describe it. And you know so that's why the two hand retrieve. It's not just being able to move the fly fast if you want to. It's you can hold the line with two hands as you come tight to the fish. Hey, hey Joe, there's a question that came through uh, chat here. Uh, is are there bonita that show up on the west wall? Yes, uh, I've I've gotten one up to about seven pounds off of the west wall, but it's the opportunity isn't consistent from year to year. The last two years, almost no one got one. Uh, three years ago, there were lots of them. Uh, lots of medium-sized fish. Two years ago, at the start of the season, I got a real big one in start of uh, September that was like an al albie-sized uh, fish. But what there's a lot of now are chub mackerel. And this is what you're most likely to catch if you went and fished there are these about pound, pound and a half hard-tailed uh, chub mackerel that would just they might go into your backing on a nine week, but just that's about as far as they'll go before you stop them. Uh, some of these fish ranged up to about two and a half pounds this last year. It seems like they're trending bigger. Very cool fish. There's uh, chub mackerel and bullet mackerel, which are not like the Atlantic mackerel that, you know, striped bass eat. They're, I mean, striped bass might still eat them, but they're <laughs> a bigger hardtail fish that blitzes. So you'll see these frothing feeds on the surface coming at you and you hook a fish. And if you had about a six weight, you would be, it would be the right size for a really dynamic, hard fighting, fast moving, you know, tricky, you know, a fish also a, a tuna species. The bullet mackerel are a sushi grade tuna. I, guys will, uh, guys will keep those just like the bonito that's, uh, and oftentimes they're a similar size to the smaller bonito that show up in the Northeast. Sometimes you get bigger ones, but when the bonito fishing has been good in the past 
four or five years, they're mostly two or three pounds, three pounds, not very big. Hey, Joe, uh, on a good or a typical day, how many, how many of these are you hooking into? I had a day this year where I landed 10, a day I landed eight. That's, you know, I've had seasons where I landed five going, you know, 20 times. It's, uh, it's a matter of how well you fish more so than how easy the fishing is on any given day. People have totally different experiences. You know, one guy might have caught four and the other guy was like, I couldn't get him to you know bite my fly today. One is a, one is a good day. You know, the, I've gotten good enough now where I've eclipsed my muskie fishing uh, rate of catch. But for me, you know, over the past five years, I caught muskies at just a high of rate time on the water versus landing albies from shore. The albies from shore, if you do it right, is an opportunity to catch more than muskies in a season. But uh, one makes the day. You're, you know, I... Only when the fishing is really good do you have opportunities to realistically catch a few. That's the that's the peak of the season. But you oftentimes have an opportunity to catch the hook one or two. And you know, for me, I like those days where I you know work hard and the 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 fight is so dynamic that if you catch a bunch of them, it's you know just like if there's a day where you caught like thirty steelhead, you know it's it detracts from the experience a little bit when the fishing's really, really good because it's a species you should work for. And it's a species every time you catch one from shore, you should feel pretty good about it. So Joe, when you're looking for the, or when you're fishing for these fish, are you, are you moving up and down the wall or moving up and down the shore a lot? Or are you, you know, you stay in stationary or how are you, how are you moving to find these fish? I move up and down the coast. I try to I try to catch them from as many different spots as I can. And sometimes, you know, as they kind of migrate certain areas, they might have, you know, might have a pack of fish working a certain area a couple days in a row and then they're gone. So you need to be, you need to look at what the wind directions are and be fishing someplace where there's a comfortable wind for, you know, the usually it's deep water spots adjacent to structure and if the wind is lightly blowing towards them you are more likely to have fish feeding in the uh in the area within your casting range i don't like the wind blowing away from me even though you can cast a little bit farther with the wind blowing away from you the fish don't usually pin food against you and so calm conditions wind parallel to you or wind coming at you is all uh is all better than wind going straight away from you. And those are situations where I would look at other places where I might be able to stand and fish and try to find, you know, a, a different, there's a lot of spots along shore. And when these things are heavily, you know, migrating through an area, there's a, a lot of places that you might be able to, uh, to catch them. But, uh, a place like the West Wall, which is a deep water break wall that goes a good quarter mile out into the ocean and allows fish to run parallel when they feed is an exceptional opportunity that concentrates fish in a much more consistent way. So if you're someone who hasn't caught one or is looking to, you know, make a trip and have that opportunity, that would be the opportunity. You know, if you're someone who's caught a bunch and have a good idea of, of you know, of where things are going on, you might have the opportunity to do a lot of different uh, things. You know, do it from the do it from the beach, do it from you know small inlets or you know little jetties. Joe, stripping bass could probably be important too, right? Yes, I've got my, uh, my stripping basket uh, right here. I prefer a silicone stripping basket that's flexible. So that uh, when you have, if you're bending over to handle a fish or or something, the uh, the the silicone stripping basket is is nice. When it's really windy, I also have a bigger, harder plastic stripping basket that uh, I use the larger one when I am concerned about the wind blowing 
the uh, the line out. I always for line preservation, if nothing else, you know, just the the rock jetties eat up a line. Even if you're in a spot where you say, you know, I don't need it. If you just lose track of where your line is just for a minute and it drops into the rocks and gets caught in a lobster trap or any any number of bullshit items that are, you know, in the rocks, it can snap your new fly line, which I've, I've broken a couple of fly lines when I was too proud to use a stripping basket. But it also helps you, you can pour some fresh water into your stripping basket. It'll keep your line wet and especially, you know, on a hot, you know, August, September day, and you're waiting for fish to show up, your line can get dry in a stripping basket and the salt water drying up, it prevents the line from clearing very easily. And so that's a, that's an important trick to carry a little bit of extra fresh water and be able to put some fresh water on your line. It, you know, helps you turn the line over and it helps you make quick presentations after a while where your line would otherwise be like dry and salty. Hey Joe, we have a uh, question coming in from the from the chat from uh, Chaz Elliott. With, with respect to fly design, how do you accomplish accomplish the fly turning on its side? You need to have the weight of the epoxy on the back be equivalent or roughly equivalent to the weight of the bend of the hook that keels what's underneath the middle of the shank. So. If the weight of the back is a little bit actually heavier than the shank, it makes the fly want to roll on its side. So when they're when you have it balanced, top and bottom, it uh, it doesn't it fishes a little bit lively. When there's a little bit more weight on the back, it will really roll on its side a little bit. And uh, that fly with this silver attached to the side especially in really bright sunlight conditions. The fish just find it from so far away because of the flash. And in really cloudy conditions, it's, it's no more effective than the one that just has the estaz on the bottom. There's something about the, the silver uh, lateral flash in the bright sunlight that, that makes the fly noticeably more effective on the, on the real sunny days, which are oftentimes hard time to catch them. You know. So, Joe, how do you tune it? Is there any advice if we want to tie it to tune it so that you get the right balance, or or are you using like a trial and error until it turns? It's it's more of a trial. You can't you can't once you've made one, you can't you know take any more epoxy off of it, and so really it's a matter of of figuring out how heavy your, you know, your hook is, let's say it's a Gamakatsu uh, SC15 one aught, which is a common uh, Albi hook. That wrapped with Estaz with, you know, it's how thick you make the clump of cashmere goat because you need to get the cash, you need to fully get the resin over the cashmere goat all the way over the back and then along where the, beyond the bend of the hook is. Yeah. So what you what you figure out is how big the chunk of material that you have to cover is that balances with the uh, weight of the bend of the hook on the underside. So then, so then you know you you tie a few of them and you figure out what the appearance of the one that really you know fishes with that top and bottom balance where it rolls. And then, you know, for me, it's like, okay, there's the balance of material with that size hook. You know, I'll take usually flies that, you know, get banged against the rocks or something, or I've caught a, caught a fish or, you know, caught a fish and then like the bend of the hook snaps for some reason. But it's like, oh, that was a good, you know, prototype. All the Albi flies, the ones that fish very well, I, all, I you know, I know I can go over here and grab certain certain albi flies and and you know as far as the evolution of this pattern you know goes and you know there are there is the first one that had the actual estaz in the bottom they've come a long way you know these don't look as nice as the other ones but these were 
effective flies, and those were all flies that were effective to the point that it stood out to me that I saved them over the past few years as I've kind of moved toward the the fly design. And that fly is really good. You know, I've got you know my musky flies, my crayfish flies. This is a really good fly. So Kurt, the the guy that I consider to be the very best false albacore fisherman who I've kind of put on a pedestal for the past pedestal for the past few years. This year he was using my fly. Really? Cool. And that's and that's that's James Brown, who's a who's a uh, professional striped bass guide from shore up in Maine. And also, I think it's caught the most bluefin tuna on a fly of anybody in the uh, in the Northeast. Really good uh, fisherman. Like, like to make note of a bit of a, a bit of a. Although I've, I think I've caught up on this topic. That guy's a, a bit of a mentor for me. He's the same age as me. He's just uh, someone who grew up in the salt. He's a really, really good dialed saltwater angler. Thank you, Joe. Any other questions? Uh, I just have one more question. Go ahead. Yeah, about um, the migration of the, the albacore. You only fish between like September to, to mid, late October. Are they coming all the way down the East Coast, say from Prince Edward Island, Maine area, or are they kind of out in the ocean and they come to shore, you know, in that, uh, in that Rhode Island, uh, you know, Massachusetts area? They're out in the ocean and they're, I think they're coming across the ocean from the Mediterranean. They come to shore, they hit the Northeast and then they move on. And so they kind of show up first along Marth, uh, Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, usually in like mid August. And then by September, they are usually along Cape Cod and starting to show up uh, along the eastern edge of Rhode Island and then they'll stay around in the Connecticut to uh, the Montauk and New Jersey area they'll be there in November where they'll kind of be gone from uh, from Cape Cod then and then they'll shoot all the way down they really show up again heavily down towards uh, North Carolina and the, uh, and the outer banks there's not great fishing for them in between there but they kind of migrate quickly from like Montauk, New Jersey area further south, but some of the same fish in the Northeast will end up down in the Outer Banks in, you know, November, December. So, so they're not uh, found at points north of, say, Massachusetts? No, they, they, they seem to come across the ocean. I know that they're doing some tagging studies uh, now to try to understand the movement of the fish uh, better, but from what I understand, they're not coming down from the north. They're they're more of a warm water fish and they're coming across and then they're heading down. They'll end up in Florida. You know, they're gonna go all the way down the uh, down the coast, and that's a fish that people catch all the time, you know, in Florida. They consider them shark bait. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Yeah. You wanna wrap it up, you guys? That was we got a half hour of uh of questions and you guys were st stuck it out. Well, uh, TC, you want to wrap it up? All right, we cut you on uh, mute. Sorry. Yeah. Um, well, I just want to say first, thank you to you, Joe. This was really, really great. And I, I think folks got a lot out of this and, you know, you've, uh, create a lot of excitement for people and curiosity. Um, I want to thank you. Uh, I also want to say thanks to um, everyone on the call for bringing, uh, bringing questions and just showing up, you know, uh, in, in a good number, even, even though we're on, we're uh, virtual. So um, yeah, again, thank you to Joe. Um, and folks on the call, if you like what you've seen, what you've seen tonight, just to kick it back to Kirk's point earlier, um, please feel free to uh, give generously to the club so we can continue to 
um, book and and compensate these uh, you know uh, you know speakers like Joe and the many other thoughtful uh, and brilliant anglers that we'll have here for the rest of the season. So that's what I've got. Kirk, any final words? Nope. Uh, we wish you a, a, a good day. Thanks again to Joe. And we'll see you in February with uh, Carl, Wexelman. Carl Wexelman. All right. Good night to Thanks, all. Guys. Thanks, guys. Good night, folks. <laughs>